Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Som TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. Today, we are going to do part two of our Spices podcast with uh, Sarah Thomas. Sarah Thomas uh, was a cast member in Som 3, and if you listen to the original one where she went through the history of several spices, including peppercorn and nutmeg and others, well, we were flooded with a lot of people who wanted a part two. So here we are. I uh, live for this stuff, and I'm so glad that all of you enjoyed the first one. Sarah and I are going to talk about three more spices, their history, and there's some pretty incredible things that uh, she was able to uncover about these three we're going to talk about. Before that, I want to tell you, Movie Mondays are back on Som TV. Every Monday night, we have a new feature film culminating with a really great one at the end of September. You guys are going to love. I'm keeping it under wraps for the moment. But it's a great wine film, one that has just premiered, and uh, you will enjoy that. If you are not a subscriber to Som TV, please go to SomTV.com, use the code word SPICES for 50% off a year membership. That's $25 for an entire year. We have feature films. We have our first major competition show, a cooking competition show called Sparklers coming. You know, we've been talking about it quite a bit. It's the closest thing to SOM we have made since we made that first feature film. It is going to be a lot of fun, a lot of shit giving. I promise you, listeners, you guys are going to love this stuff. Without further ado, my buddy and someone I look up to very much, Sarah Thomas. Sarah, it is a pleasure to have you back on. You know, we did the original Spice podcast and we kind of bit off more than we could chew. We thought we were going to do many more (laughs) <laughs> than we got to, didn't we? There's just so much to talk about, but I'm really happy to be back to continue that conversation because it was very, very fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, we asked people, do you want us to do another one? And I was overwhelmed <laughs> by the amount of people who said, let's really- Sarah back on and talk about spices and their origins and all this stuff. And I was like, yes, this is everything I want to do. So it's... Uh, well, that's very gratifying. Thank you. <laughs> so to the people who asked... We are back to talk more about spices with the most qualified person I know to speak about this topic. The writer of Kalamata's Kitchen. Your book is just released. We need to plug it. So proud of you. I can't stand it. I'm so proud of you. You wonderful <laughs> Thank person. You. Thank you. How is the release going? Tell everybody where they can get it. And then you should buy this book. If you have children, if you're adventurous, tell us how's it going. Thank you, Jason. It's going really, really well. I'm super happy with everything. I think I mentioned last time, this story is based on my own childhood memories of my mom mom cooking dal in our kitchen and the way I would be transported by the scents and the sounds of spices cooking in oil and and tempering and frying and all the things that would waft out from that. So it's obviously very tied into what we're talking about today. You can buy the book everywhere books are sold, wherever you like to buy books, indie bookstores, Amazon, whatever. It's there, which is really cool and fun to say now because, you know, after self-publishing, like that's not the case. And that now, you know, it's everywhere. It's so cool to talk to a famous person on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> it's really an amazing thing. You're from Psalm 3 all the way to being the person that I know and people see me on the street and they're like, didn't you work with Sarah Thomas in Psalm oh, 3? Oh, stop it. Did. You stop it. A couple it. things. So your your book, before we get to Spices, your book, Kalamata's Kitchen, my wife and I bought copies for my two daughters and then also for their classrooms. Thank you. And then also for our niece nieces and nephews. And this is one of the like supremely wonderful things where you recommend it and you really mean it. I really Aww. mean this book is wonderful. Everybody needs to get it. I appreciate that, Jason. Thank you so much. And I'm going to do this on the air on my podcast. We have another Psalm film coming called The Cup of Salvation and you are going to be in it. We have to schedule this up. You're over in New York and I'm in LA and COVID has really screwed things up. In fact, I still have to shoot in the Vatican and a few other places, but you're one of the main things. So I'm going to put you to the fire here on my podcast that you're one of the last big elements and you're a major part of this film. So we got to schedule this up and get you in this project we've been talking about for years. Let me know. I'm in. I'm in. Okay, good, good, good. Now, all listeners know that you, <laughs> you're you held to the fire for They good. can hold me to it. Good, I love it. All right, so <laughs> let's talk spices. So what are we going to talk about today? Last episode, we talked about peppercorn. Yes, peppercorn, cinnamon, um, and nutmeg. And nutmeg. Yes, and today we're going to talk about turmeric, we're going to talk about cumin, and we're going to talk about chili peppers. Fantastic. Okay. Yes. I'm assuming these are all just lovely, happy stories with nothing negative. Well, you know me. Yeah. That's how we let into it, isn't it? No. I mean, uh, like all spices, these also have somewhat bloody histories, but not all the same as the first three we talked about. <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> stories, I have to say. Very necessary ones. Good. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. It's tough for some people, myself included, to know that a lot of the things that we often take for granted food-wise and things come with a lot of socioeconomic and cultural things, and especially when you wrap history around that. Yeah, but you know what? It's never too late to learn about it. And it's not like you're a bad person for 
you know, not knowing before, but now that you know, like you can make better decisions. So it's like, I can understand a sense of discomfort around hearing around history and like, it is uncomfortable. There's lots of it that is just horrible. And there's lots of rippling effects of things that happened centuries ago that we still see today. But now that we know, and now that we talk about it more often, there's lots of ways we can help lessen the residual harmful impacts, particularly on the people who grow the spices. That's good. I I like the idea of looking backwards to learn, but not using the anger. You move that forwards and try to exactly. rectify it through action. That's great. Exactly right. That's great. I just want to say, you know, this is your pod here. I mean, I host it, but this is your your deal. But turmeric is like, it's so hip. I mean, it's such a like, <laughs> hipster thing. I mean, I think my wife does like turmeric shots, you know, and like, yeah. right, anyways, turmeric. Let's talk about turmeric, that really orange. Yeah, golden, orange, yellow, beautiful spice. Turmeric has one of the happier stories, I would say. So I'm glad we're starting with it. So basically, <laughs> you know, as you said, it is definitely becoming, it has become humongous in Western wellness circles. And why not? It has all these incredible anti-inflammatory properties, and antiseptic properties, which we'll get into. As with all of the other spices we've spoken about, this is one of the most ancient spices in the world, and it comes from India. It is written about in Vedic texts like from 4,000 years ago. And it has medicinal roots, particularly in Ayurveda, which uh, we talked a little bit about last time. That's the Indian science of life. In Sanskrit alone, there's like 50 different names for turmeric. And there's names that signify like kind of what it does. And that tells you a little bit about how widespread and how widely used used and how useful this plant has been throughout history. Some of them signify like triumph over disease. Some of them just refer to the golden color. Some of them refer to beautification techniques. And that's like as beautiful as moonlight is like one of the words means that, you know, you'll find it called halbi in the north, manyal in the south of India. And historically it was used for, for cooking, for medicine, for dye, for cosmetics. Personally, it's in everything that I cook. One of my turmeric's favorite- in everything you cook. Pretty much everything Indian that I make has turmeric in it. It's really like a backbone spice. And it's interesting because okay. it is, it's very versatile. It doesn't have the pungency all the time of like all of the other spices, but it is a backbone spice and a lot of Indian cooking. And, you know, one of my favorite memories from my wedding was our Haldi ceremony, which is a beautification ceremony where your relatives rub turmeric and sandalwood all over you to beautify you for your wedding. Okay. <laughs> yeah, which is I fun. Love it. It's a That's very great. fun thing. It's very sweet. I bet you smell good after that sandalwood You smell and great. You're glowing. You know, it's very nice. Everybody's blessing you. Like, it's the best. On that note, how do you describe what turmeric smells and tastes like? I mean, I know people have come in contact with it, but some people may not have had the actual raw turmeric in their hands before. Yeah. What does it smell and taste like? So most people will encounter it in a dried and powdered form, right? So it comes from a rhizome that you have to boil and process, and then you dry it out and you grind it down into powder. Typically, that's how people encounter it for cooking food. Really, really good turmeric. It's like almost honeyed. It has like a sort of sweet scent to it, but it's very earthy. It can be very floral. It can be kind of zippy, like have like kind of citrusy over notes as well. I don't think that's what most people would get if they opened up a jar of turmeric that they bought in the grocery store. Most of that is you know, mixed with all kinds of other stuff. There's dyes. It's not an origin. If you get a single origin turmeric and you put it side by side, it's like a completely different thing. I buy mine from Diaspora, from Burlap and Barrel, and from Spice Wallow. If you want to get like really good, really beautiful, aromatic, fragrant turmeric, those are places that I would recommend buying them. The thing is, it's ubiquitous because of the spice trade. Again, it was pre-European traders. It was already traded all over Eastern Asia. It features in the cuisines and the medicinal traditions more so in like China and Japan and Egypt. And this is all in like 700, 800 AD. Like it didn't have anything to do with the Europeans, but it did spread further because of that. And what's interesting is that it was not quite as valuable, right? So it traveled because people enjoyed its inclusion in their food and it was part of the diets that traveled of the traders that traveled around, but it wasn't valued in the same way that a lot of the other ones were. So in a way, people didn't like rape and pillage to get turmeric to take all over the world with them. Mm -hmm. They took it because they liked it and it was useful for many, many things. I'm assuming that the people also raped and pillaged, but it wasn't because of the turmeric. So that's good. Right. No, they did. The turmeric wasn't the cause of it. It's just, you know. Then if you fast forward a while, it traveled all over because of, you know, early European colonizers and all this stuff. And then the British show up, you know, the greatest colonizers of India. And they were like, this food... It's all very complicated. Uh, Can we just put it all in one jar or something? So they are sort of the reason that curry powder was invented, right? They basically made a spice mix or had Indians make a spice mix. And curry powder actually has its own very fascinating place in globalization as the British kind of took it with them everywhere to all of their colonies. And now you have curry powder can have tons of different spices in it, but it always has turmeric. It's like one of the primary ingredients always has turmeric in it. Mm -hmm. It traveled everywhere with the British. It traveled with all of their indentured labor 
flavor for all of their colonies. And it's been adapted now into so many cuisines that it is part of those cuisines, right? It doesn't belong to any one cuisine, even if it comes from India. It is part of Japanese cuisine. It's part of German cuisine for currywurst. It's part of every Caribbean cuisine, which is pretty interesting. And it's boomed, as you said, it's now become like a huge thing in the Western wellness community within the last few years, which has led to it being cultivated in places like Nicaragua and Costa Rica, where it's not part of Mm -hmm. the cuisine at all, but they farm it to meet the demand. And in addition to India and East Asian countries, and that's to meet particularly U.S. demand. Yeah. Well, you see it everywhere. I mean, anywhere you can go get a wheatgrass shot or something like that, you see like turmeric as being something. What kind of dishes you know, let's take on on the Indian side of things and then Chinese and Asian and then also just into general American dishes. What dishes should we be using turmeric in? Where do you see it and what should we be using it in? Since you cook with it so much, you must yeah. have all sorts of recommendations. Well, I mean, mine are primarily Indian, right? So I'm not an expert on like all the ways that turmeric specifically is used in a lot of other cuisines, but specifically for ours, I mean, we put it in everything, right? So like one of the easiest, healthiest things you can possibly make for yourself and your kids is dal. And, you know, oftentimes whatever dal you use, they add turmeric and for color. A lot of Indian food, you know, a lot of it's boiled for long periods of time, right? The rice dishes, the legumes, the pulses. And so in order to kind of liven it up, you usually make some sort of masala mix with it. And turmeric will be added oftentimes in the boiled part of it. So like in the dal, in the rice, whatever, and also put into like the fried masala mix that you, or the tadka or whatever that you use afterwards uh, to put into dishes. So it is just ubiquitous. If you find an Indian recipe, it probably has turmeric in it. Because it's such a staple, I just really highly recommend getting the really good stuff. And I love that it's become something that people focus on for wellness because why not? People for thousands of years have known that it has all of these benefits. What benefits? Because that's a great thing to talk about. Yeah, it has health benefits. Cumin is an active ingredient that is an anti-inflammatory and an antiseptic primarily. Those are the two things that are kind of like agreed upon are its greatest character. And then like topically, it also has all these effects. Like it'll probably because of the antiseptic qualities will like help your skin glow and all these things. And so there's lots of ways to use it. The only issue I've ever had with the adoption of it is when people pretend like they've just discovered it because that's just modern colonization, right? Like that's just weird to me. It's like, do you have to feel like you discovered it in order for people to like listen to you? Just like chill about that, you know? Well, I don't think a lot of hipsters in Brooklyn are reading ancient Veda texts, but you know, it's uh, probably, maybe they are though, if anywhere, it's probably, if anywhere, actually that's like where they're doing it. They they have Sanskrit tattoos. I can say that. I can tell you that. That is true. Which they discovered. They discovered Yes, right. Right, of course, of course. But you know, when we're talking about wellness, right, when you're talking about this idea of wellness, I think it's critical, you know, not to, well, actually to harp on this point. Part of wellness is making sure that your sourcing of this thing is you know, commit to your own wellness, but commit to the wellness of other people too. Like just look outside of yourself. And if you want golden milk, which we call healthy food, by the way, the turmeric lattes, just make sure that wherever you're sourcing this stuff from the people who are growing it are actually treated like human being. And the stuff that you buy, kind of the mass produced stuff that you put it in your lattes or you do whatever else you take it in shots or whatever, just even from a purely health benefit standpoint, there's a fraction of the human in it, which is the active chemical, than some of the single origin options that you'd get from places like Diaspora, Burlap and Barrel, Spice Swallow. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to think that, you know, if somebody finds out there's something good for your liver or whatever, and they do believe they found it, but that's human nature. I think that that is, it's, well, it shouldn't be, but oftentimes it's human nature to say like, you know, whatever it is that you found, you know, there's so many examples. Turmeric is one of these things that's great on chicken. It's great on rice. You know, people listening should give it a shot. It really does go with almost everything. You're right. <laughs> From my experience. It does. It's really versatile and like it's mild enough in flavor that you can mix it into lots of things and still get the flavor, aromatic and like health benefits of eating it. So like, why not incorporate it? Very cool. Now let's get into... Uh, America's favorite spice, cumin. Yeah. <laughs> is that America's is. Favorite, favorite spice? I think I it might be. I mean, okay. cumin is really fascinating. Cumin is like truly a global spice. And like in everything at Chipotle, right? Like I think that makes it America's favorite spice. Yeah, oh, for sure. It's an ancient spice as well. For me, I'm like smiling when I'm thinking about talking about cumin only because it was one of the formative memories of mine um, when I was that's it, actually in the Kalamata's Kitchen book because it's a very pungent, it's a very musky, like strong smell. I can smell it now just yeah. when you're talking about it. I, I, I can smell it. To me, it has 
almost like a tactile nature to it. Like it kind of fills me up in a way. And in the spread in Kalamata's kitchen where she smells it, she's actually wafted away by these curls of cumin. And that's exactly how I feel whenever I smell it. And, you know, sort of enrobed in it. So the history of this very globe trotting spice that is found in cuisines all over the world is super interesting. Basically, even the word cumin is really old. And it's not often that super, super ancient words like have staying power in the English language. Cumin actually is one of the only ones that is from Sumerian. And it was initially Gamun wow. or Gamun. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. This is like more than 4,000 years ago. Hugely popular in antiquity. This is heavily featured in the oldest recipes that you can find, like most of which are from what is now Southern Iraq. They all involve cumin. The ancient Mesopotamians apparently just like put it in everything. It's listed in Greek medical texts, all kinds of weird uses. <laughs> it's kind of ubiquitous on Roman tables. It's one of the most highly traded goods along the Silk Road and other spice trade routes. Because of that, becomes a hallmark of cuisine in places like Xi'an and China, all through India. Cumin was actually brought to India and to China and all of that through the Middle East. This is like a Mesopotamian spice. And it was traded and valued highly, but also not as much as cinnamon or black pepper. And I think part of the reason for that, it was just easier to cultivate. So it actually just grew in more places. It can grow in kind of a spectrum of weathers. It doesn't require that like very densely sort of subtropical climate that a lot of the other ones do. So, you know, fast forward and Spanish settlers come to America. They start growing cumin in Mexico in like 16th ish century. And now it is one of the most distinctive spices in Mexican and I would say in US Southwestern food. Everywhere that people traveled, cumin traveled to. Well, so if turmeric is a root, a rhizome, what is cumin? What is the actual plant? Cumin's a little seed. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it traveled with people wherever people went for as long as people have eaten food, which is as long as there have been people. So the seed is the spice, but the seed itself also brings the plant, which creates new seeds. It sounds like that one would be hard to keep secret. Totally. You know, that one would be yeah. very difficult. Yeah. And again, it can grow in a spectrum of climate and humidity, which is not the case for lots of the other ones. So you're exactly right. It was harder to keep secret. And so like, Yes, it traveled because it was valued, but it more traveled because people liked it, which again is a slightly happier history than some of the other spices. So look at us, <laughs> we're on a roll here. Okay, all right, but I like to this. To me, it's also one of the ones that like, I remember when I really started tasting wine, it was a reference point that I had and that wasn't the case. It wasn't an often used descriptor, but it was one that I found quite regularly, particularly in sort of like older wines and oxidized wines. And then I found out, later as I actually started to study wine properly that it's because of sotlan, which is a compound that has this very distinctive smell like people smell like kind of muskiness maple syrup, curry leaf stuff like that and I would pick up a wine and I'd be like oh this is like old vancho and it smells like a curry leaf to me and that's what it is and cumin has the same thing so oftentimes I would say cumin because that was a little bit more well known I guess than curry leaves but same thing. It's funny you know I did a podcast with Steve Mathiasen winemaker and he basically railed against the way we describe wine because of how ethnocentric it actually is yeah. in that certain people will say things are like, uh, I forget what his example was, but you know, you might say it's like a rose leaf or it's like a rose hip or something like that. When certain parts of the world, that's not a thing. Yeah. Or I forget what his example was, but essentially, you know, if you come from a place like India where the smells are, I say overwhelming in a good way, there's just so much. I would imagine your description of wine being something that is either much easier to come at or much harder because you have more options or more things to dig through your brain. Here's a just a psalm thing. I tried very hard to not give tasting notes to guests. I had other ways of describing wines, like structural things that I think were more important than flavor profiles because I was acutely aware of how many conventional tasting tasting notes that I had to learn as I studied wine didn't really apply to my own scent and flavor vocabulary, but I had to learn them. And I would never have wanted to impose that on any of my guests, many of whom came from all over the world. All of describing wine is about the frame of reference that you're coming from. What are the scents that resonate with you? You remember them for a reason. That's why you can find them in certain wines. And it comes down to it, the same chemical compounds are in a lot of those flavors as are in the wines. We have just a very limited scope of what we've deemed acceptable. We've said only these fruits and these vegetables and these herbs can be used to describe that when in fact Sotolan came out of fenugreek. But if you said fenugreek, I don't know how meaningful it is or whether it would have been, you know, accepted in a time when I cared about such things. Right, 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 <laughs> right. Well, at the same time, you know, hope it would have been. <laughs> I hope so too. I, I didn't really, I, I didn't really try to yeah, be honest. I don't, so it's just yeah. like, whatever, let's go Well, with that's this. a little tangent, but I think a lot of the listeners can relate to the way or maybe despise the way wine is described. So, you know, it kind of makes sense when we're speaking about, you know, spices. Yeah. So cumin on to, before the podcast started, you said there's a little bit of controversy in this next one, even calling it a spice. Chili. Well, I don't know if there's a controversy or not, or maybe I just made it no, up. No, I mean, I'm it's just, huge. I mean, there's a, be... <laughs> there are people marching, right? Right now, somewhere, by 
about yeah. this. It's a controversy only in my own mind. I mean, say like a chili plant, I don't think technically is a spice, but the way it is, particularly the way it's encountered by most people in that it is typically dried, ground, or flaked, or whatever, it is used the same way that we use spices. I typically use more fresh chilies, but most people, I think, encounter chili powder, chili flakes, whatever. And, you know, I think it has the reputation of being like the spiciest, I'm doing air quotes, the spiciest of spices. So why not include it, you know? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I would have, prior to you saying that, just assumed it was a spice. I would never have really thought about the distinction. It might be. I might just be trying to figure this out in my own head as we're going, to be honest. It was just a thought I had. <laughs> it's like, I don't think this no, is No, yeah. Spice. We uh, got to calm the controversy and you know, just make it, everybody <laughs> needs to stop stop arguing about this. All right, so chili, you're talking about like Thai chilies, right? Like something in Thai food kind of thing? Like that's what you mean? or Yes, I'm talking about the chili pepper, which I'm glad that you mentioned that the first thing you thought of was Thai food because being Indian, I would think of Indian food, but next I would think of Thai food. I would think of Korean food. Mm. There's a lot of cuisines that are very, very defined by the presence of chili in their food. But what's so interesting is that this actually had a kind of reverse migration from the majority of the spices that we've talked about and actually the majority of spices that people are very familiar with. So the story of the chili pepper actually starts in South America, unlike you know all the other ones we've talked about, though its history is just as old. So indigenous populations in South America and particularly in Brazil is where I, they believe the origin origin is, also dates back around 4,000 years. And so we know that they were used widely in indigenous cuisine. We know that they were cultivated by native South Americans, probably again, starting in Brazil. And they spread very widely and rapidly all over South and Central America as a plant. It was a very successful plant because they're spread not by mammals who are sort of limited in their movement and travel by where they live, but by birds. Mammals don't eat chilies because they're hot. You feel pain when you eat capsaicin. Well, we do because we're crazy, but like animals, (laughs) it tends to to not eat chilies, but birds can't feel capsaicin. So they eat these things and they also defecate the seeds whole. So birds, they spread this wide, which is amazing. And then early Mesoamericans domesticated these wild chilies and started cultivating them. Then you fast forward for a while and unfortunately you get Columbus who shows up looking for gold gold and also black gold, which is pepper. He does not find black pepper, but what he does find is this wild chili that happens to have small round fruits. And he eats one. As he did with the people, he decides it's close enough. You know, he said the people here, that the close enough to Indians, we'll call them Indians. Yeah. And he decides this chili, close enough to black pepper, we'll call it pepper. And he takes it back with him to Europe. Now, at this point, you know, 15th century, this is crazy. Chili doesn't exist in India. It doesn't exist in India. The spicy food in India is spiced with black pepper primarily and like lots of other spices, but not chili pepper. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't exist in Eastern Asia or any of the cuisines that we really, you know, associate with it. But thankfully, we don't have to credit Columbus with that exactly because it was actually the Portuguese traders who introduced the chili to India by their trade routes in Goa in particular in South India. And they were good people. Oh, yeah, they were awesome. I'm sorry. I'm such a smart ass. I apologize. (laughs) I want to take a weird weird step back and say I was having this problem with my bird feeders about two months ago that the squirrels were eating everything. And so somebody told me to mix pepper powder into the bird seed so the birds, they can't taste it. They could care less. They go down and eat the bird seed. They don't think twice. And the squirrels stayed away. It's amazing. So just just a practical use where you were talking about the capsaicin like that mammals can taste it and birds can't. That's how it can immediately impact. If you're one of the weirdos like me who has squirrel problems, (laughs) then you can... All right. Listen, that's important. That's very important. Yeah. So the pepper comes to Asia Mm -hmm. via South America, which is such a unique situation. Which is very different, right? Because on the other hand, for pretty much everything else, you have these colonizers and traders coming in and taking all the stuff from the native lands, which they do to Chile's, obviously. But like, usually it's coming in the other direction. Usually they're taking stuff from India, from Sri Lanka, from Indonesia, and they're taking it to Europe. And in this case, they're also taking it forcefully from South America, and they're bringing it to India. And the Portuguese actually had way more effective and influential trade routes than the Spanish. And with them, wherever they went, also went chilies. They understood its preservation properties and also that it tasted good. Easily adapted into Indian cuisine, easily adapted into a lot of East Asian cuisines, which already used very pungent ingredients like ginger and black pepper. So it fit right in. They were like, cool, another way to plus this up. This is great. And now it wouldn't shock me if someone told me there were 5,000 different kinds of chilies just in India, let alone all over East Asia. I don't know. I don't know the number, but there's tons. They're cultivated everywhere. They're so ingrained in the food of so many different Asian countries that I think you'd be forgiven for thinking that they 
they are indigenous to Asia, but they are not. In fact, you know, in the relative timeline of spices, they're a baby in the usage and cuisine of those countries, but of course, also ubiquitous. Yeah. So what you just mentioned of the traveling of things that now become something that is you associate with a culture, this is something that blows my mind always. And I can hear the same story over and over again. The fact that corn wasn't in Italy, there was no polenta. Tomatoes were not in Italy. Those came from the new world. Yeah. All of these little things that you now just take for granted when you go and you have pizza in Naples or you have you know, any of these things, they just didn't exist. Pasta came from China. There was no pasta in Italy until, you know, whether you want to believe Marco Polo or whatever story you want to believe. It's truly an incredible thing. This is like the 1% time that it went the reverse direction. It has happened. Potatoes. I mean, potatoes, you think about Ireland and all these things. Well, those came from the new world and that's not a long time ago. Well, the world wasn't so new to the people who lived there. It was... Well, that's and true. That's very true. But it, goes, years, but it goes back to people thinking that they've invented something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and right. They have not. I mean, to take it full circle, it's, you know, polenta was being made in some form for a very, very long time in its yeah. native land in Mesoamerica. So it's just a tough thing to think about. It's really interesting. And I think one of the most interesting things about Chile in particular is that technically this means that Chiles were in the hands of Europeans long before they were in the hands of the Indians, the Thai, the Chinese, the Koreans, etc., all of those latter cuisines really enthusiastically adopted into their cuisines, right? Into their cultures, into their cuisines. And what's so weird to me is that, you know, with the exception of the Hungarians who developed a less spicy pepper to make paprika, chilies like yeah. don't really become part of any European cuisine until like way later in Calabria. In, Calabria, yeah, but right? like maybe it's like later yeah. in, in modernity that all of this. Yeah, maybe that would be like one example. I would say in general, there's no kind of traditional European cuisine that is defined by this, and it's just always so interesting to me that like Europeans pillage the world for spices and then like really put very little of them in their own food um, <laughs> until until modernity, right? When the former colonies become more adopted into the fabric of the colonizing countries, it's just very interesting to me. This has happened many times in Europe, but one particular time I was in Greece and uh, we asked for some. Spice, you know, for the food. I wanted something spicy. I just happened to really, I like eat. And uh, they gave me Hungarian paprika and they were like, be very careful. I had it and I'm like, all right, so this must be like something different. And you put it on, I'm like, yeah. I mean, there's not, you know, it's just a very, I suppose it, it speaks to a different palate yeah. or whatever you want to call that. Different cultures, different traditions, and that's fine. I'm not saying every food has to be super spicy. It is just oh, so no, interesting I'm, to I'm me. I'm not either. I just <laughs> think it's funny. Yeah, it's you just know? so funny to me that this in particular was adopted with such enthusiasm in so many places, even though the Europeans had it first and they just like really didn't do much with it. That wasn't that long ago either. I think people just take for granted that, oh, forever, New York City's looked like this. That is not that long ago. Could you picture Szechuan China? The concept of it, the idea of Szechuan without capsicum. I mean, I can't even, that's the first thing yeah. I think of when I think of that entire yeah, area. Yeah, chilies and the Szechuan peppercorn, which as we learned last time, not the same as the Malabar peppercorn, but very spicy and tingly and has its own like really cool things. Yes, that and the red chilies, it defines so much of the food of the region. Yeah. The same way that Thai chilies define so much of the food of different parts of regional Thailand and similarly in India, that all the different kinds of chilies that you can get, the different ways they're prepared, whether they're pickled or smoked first or however they're incorporated, it's always so unique. And people developed really strong traditions around these peppers all over Asia and Eastern Asia. And they're just so part of the cultural fabric now. Another kind of interesting thing about the movement of chilies is that it had sort of like multiple dispersion tactics, right? You have the birds that are actually physically carried these peppers all over the place. Wherever the plant is, birds will eat it and they'll spread it. People will like it, they'll cultivate it. I think, you know, certainly they're just as we're talking about like the absolute ubiquity of chilies now and cuisine now also in like Mexico and Southwestern United States. Yes, some of them were likely like just from Mexico and I'm sure native and indigenous people have been cooking with them forever, but they didn't really take hold in kind of the Southwestern cuisine of uh, the United States until the trade actually of enslaved people. The Portuguese had actually also taken chili peppers to their colonies in West Africa. It's definitely a huge part, uh, really hot chili peppers are a huge part of a lot of West African cuisine. And in a strange mm -hmm. turn of events, those chilies that were cultivated later wow. came back because of the, the trade of enslaved people. So there's all these really interesting and, you know, obviously tragic. So like the Caribbean jerk, like Caribbean jerk pepper and all of that kind of thing, you mean? And, yeah. And, and also the Mexican. Correct. Cuisine? Wow. I did not know that. That is amazing. It's really interesting because it just kept traveling. So many different kinds of chilies now traveled. That's the cool thing about it is not only were they dispersed in so many different ways, so many interesting ways, you know, just from a plant perspective and from a, like a traditional, like the indigenous movement of it, but also 
due to all of this human activity and Chile's going wherever people went. It just never stopped moving. I find the routes these things take to end up becoming so commonplace to us just endlessly fascinating. I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is what I want to talk about forever is kind of how we got where we are. And even when you think you understand something like this, a journey, a pepper takes something, there's always another twist or turn. Sarah, I would do this forever. I mean, obviously, if I get bombarded <laughs> enough, we'll hound you to do this again. Do part three? All right. Oh, uh, I mean, I, I, it, could go, it could go off. <laughs> yeah, we could do spices. I mean, there's a lot more you can talk about too, which is really exciting. <laughs> it's an honor to have you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Everybody, please, if you're looking for a gift for a niece, nephew, child, or just adventurous yourself, Kalamata's Kitchen, you have to get the book. It's out there. Sarah's very famous, so we appreciate your time. <laughs> It's really an honor to have you here. <laughs> You're very funny, I'm Jason. Serious. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I am serious. I am serious. All right, you be safe, kid. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Please keep the suggestions coming. Hit me up on Twitter at Jason B. Wise or get us on Instagram, the Som Films account, Som TV. Let us know what you want to hear. There are uh, lots of good things coming, but we always love your ideas and I want to hear. Also, don't forget to rate the podcast wherever you listen. That means a lot to the entire team. This episode was mixed by Alex McCourt, produced by Nadine Netman. And if you're not a Som TV subscriber, SomTV.com, code word, spices. 50% off for an entire year. You spend more than 25 bucks on, you know, a 12 pack of beer sometimes, you hipsters. Go to somtv.com, get a year for 25 bucks. Spices. All right, everybody, be safe. Talk to you soon. Bye.